Tune in for Series 4 of the Hip Talks podcast, a series of discussions on legal issues hosted by Hugel and Ip Solicitors, an independent boutique law firm in Hong Kong providing bespoke legal services and exceptional client service to individuals, families, entrepreneurs and businesses locally and internationally. Clients have diverse issues. Some require immediate attention and speedy outcomes. Others require the building of a long-term partnership between solicitor and client. In all situations and for all clients, Hugel and Ip provides clear, practical advice to help achieve the best results. The firm has achieved outstanding recognitions in the most recent editions of the major legal directories, as well as remarkable results in the areas of dispute resolution, corporate and commercial, trusts and estate, family, employment, business immigration and data privacy. Hi, this is Francis Tung. I'm an associate at Hugo & Nip, and today I'm with Rafael Wong, a senior associate at Hugo & Nip, and we are from the family team. Today, we're going to do a podcast about adoption. Talking about adoption, there are two classes of cases that we usually see. So the first one is adoption, which is done through the social welfare department. Um, this relates mostly to abandoned children or children to whom the applicant is not a relative or a step parent. And there is the other class of cases called the private adoption, which mostly relates to step parents and relatives adopting um a relative child. Um, this is a podcast about the latter kind, um, private adoption, because this is where lawyers usually get involved. In some cases, uh, private adoption might also involve adopting a child from overseas. And um, there is a class called convention adoption, um, which mainly relates to um, adoption from overseas. So, uh, Rafael, would you mind talking about um, the statistics in relation to adoption published by the social welfare department? Thank you, Francis. Um, I was looking up at the data yesterday, and uh, as of the end of June 2022, according to the Social Welfare Department, there are about 174 adoption by local homes, 26 cases of adoption by overseas families, and only about 30 cases of privately arranged adoption by relatives. And what's more interesting is that according to the social welfare departments, there are actually no normal and healthy children available for adoption. Now, this is not to be read as uh, anything wrong. It's simply because if the children are normal and healthy, chances are you do not need an adoption in the very first place. And also the problem with this figure is that uh, it fails to account for applications of private adoption where they are not, uh, where, where the infants are not even in the pool in the very first place. Perhaps, Francis, you can talk about the um, criteria for the adoption. Sure. In the context of a private adoption, um, we will need to consider a number of criteria which the applicant has to meet. So the guiding principle in all of these cases is the best interest of the child. And this principle is translated into criteria listed in the adoption ordinance and subsidiary legislations. So firstly, we'll need to look at the age of the applicant. If it is a sole applicant, then uh, he or she needs to be at least 25 years old. But if it is a joint application um, by spouses, then one of them has to be at least 25 and the other at least 21. Apart from that, um, of course, the applicant will also need to have good mental and physical health conditions. And we also need to consider whether they have stable employment, uh, whether they have um, any criminal uh, record. And we will also need to consider the circumstances of um, the child in question, as in whether um, the child has any siblings. Um, so if there is, um, let's say, a brother or sister of the child, then um, it is um, the usual case that we will prefer for both children to be adopted together. Um, we will also need to consider if there are any other children um, of um, the sole applicant or the joint applicant as spouses, because obviously when um, an adopted child enters into the family, uh, they are going to be um, living together with um, all those other children. And of course, um, the adopted children um, must be under the age of 18 and not married. And um, the children has uh, also to be in the actual custody of the applicant for at least six consecutive months before an adoption order can be granted. 
However, uh, we do see uh, a number of issues practically when um, these criteria um, are put in place. So, Rafael, would you mind sharing your views on what practical issues we might face in terms of a private adoption? Now, uh, one of the criteria, obviously, perhaps the most important criteria, I would say, is the consent of the birth parents. Now, according to the adoption ordinance, parents have to give consents, but not only parents, but also whoever is liable to pay and also the guardian of the infants would have to give consents, uh, depending on the circumstances of the case. Um, the, the law also specified, uh, interestingly, that if the child is born out of wedlock, that means the child was born when the parents are not married, the father would not be considered as a parent unless he applies under Section 31 of the GMO. But however, in practice, the courts would always ask for um, father who are born out of wedlock for his consent. There is also a trend that the courts would ask for DNA tests uh, for infants that are born out of wedlock. So it's very important that we secure the birth parents' consents before we even start the application. Otherwise, uh, we might need to dispense with that particular parent's consent, and that would lengthen or delay the application substantially. Um, we also have to draw a distinction between general consent and specific consent. Because for general consent, once it is signed, the person signing the general consent would give up all his or her rights at the time of signing of the document. Whereas if you are signing a specific consent, then your rights would only be given up once or at the time the adoption order is made. Um, there is an exception to the rule that, for example, if this is a step-parent's adoption, meaning that, for example, the stepfather is adopting the infant uh, of his current wife, then even though the wife would sign a specific consent for the stepfather to adopt um, the infant, that mother who signed the consent would not give up her parental rights uh, under the law. So that is a exception to the general rule where if you sign a specific consent, you give up your rights. And for signing of the consent form, uh, we often comes across situation where the birth parents are not even in Hong Kong. So when they are signing the form, they need to be careful that they are signing the form properly and be attested in accordance with the local law wherever they are. Uh, but usually in practice, so long as they sign before a notary, it should be safe. And consent form can also be signed before the application is made. In fact, it's very often that these consent forms are signed before the application is made, so that in practice we will know that consent can be secured before even we make the application. If we are not able to secure consent, then we will have to seek the dispense with that particular parent's consent. And in law, we can only dispense with a party's consent if he or she abandoned, neglect, or ill-treated the infant, if he or she fails to make payments, uh, persistently neglected or refused to contribute, incapable of giving consent or consent unreasonably withheld. And there is also a catch-all principle or catch-all criteria where the court can also dispense with the consent in all circumstances of the case. Now, there is also another restriction on the adoption. If it is a private and local adoption, both the infants and the applicants must reside in Hong Kong. Now, this rule obviously does not apply to convention adoption where clearly the infant and the applicant are residing at different places. Um, there is also very interesting restriction under the law where it says a male applicant cannot adopt a female infant. What do you think about it, Francis? <laughs> um, well, honestly, I think it is a rather 
ancient rule, but one that is that that an applicant would not usually expect. But um, and it's really easy to overlook, and that's why um, when you are um in the context of a private adoption, you'll you will need legal representation and lawyers to tell you that in fact um, this rule exists. But I do think there has to be a time when um, this rule has to go away in terms of um, adoption because um, there is no valid grounds for this rule to exist anymore and it's um, a rather ancient uh, rule to be there in, in the first place. Um, Rafael, have you encountered any cases where um, an applicant um, runs into a problem or an issue because of the application of this rule? Uh, we, we did. We did, actually. We have an ongoing case right now, precisely with the same issue. And we also did another case, which uh, I managed to convince the judge that he should disregard this provision. Now, the purpose of this restriction, if I may say so, is to guard against a potential risk and aims at protecting a young female infants from possible sexual abuse by a sole male applicant. Um, there, there were some changes to the law. Uh, in fact, the law was amended because of discussion regarding this um, potentially discrimination um, provision. And in the end, they have amended the wordings and they added a exceptions to the rule which says you may circumvent this if there are special circumstances of the case. Um, it's it's unclear by Hong Kong cases what amounts to special circumstances, but what we did in the previous case was that um, it was a stepfather trying to adopt a female, but that female was about to turn eighteen. So uh, and she. Uh, indicated clear and strong intention uh, for the adoption to go through, and then the and obviously her mother are residing with the stepfather. So it's not like uh, although it's a sole male applicant, but in practice the three of them are living together. Um, another thing is that the consent form signed by the parents, a specific consent form, where they specifically allowed this step-parents or step-father to adopt the child. So in the end, the judge was prepared to uh, accept my submissions and simply allow the adoption. Um, we, we do have a similar case right now where we are also trying to help a step-father. Well, not, not a step-father, actually, in this case, is a grandfather. Is the grandfather uh, trying to adopt the granddaughter. It is it's unclear what the judge will say about this case, but uh, I'm prepared to run similar arguments, and I hope that the judge is prepared to disregard this, what I agree with you as kind of an ancient law, as uh, this restriction shouldn't be gender-specific because uh, sexual abuse can happen either way. And uh, follow up from what you have said, that there should be a six-month continuous care. Now, uh, I just want to expand a little bit on that because the rule clearly stated, stated that if the child or the infant is studying abroad or staying in boarding school or in the hospital, it does not break the, uh, the counting of the duration. So for example, within that six months of care time, um, the child is unfortunately staying in the hospital, that would not necessarily break the, the duration of the six months. There is another quite unfortunate restriction, in my opinion, is that not everyone can arrange for adoption or place an infant for adoption. There are only when placing infants for adoption unless you are a director uh, accredited, bo accredited body, or if you are acting under a court order. Now, this rule does not apply to certain um, applicants, namely if you are a parent of the infant, or if you are a relative of the infant, or if you are simply a step-parent. It sounds quite uh, reasonable, but the problem with that is the definition of relative is very restricted under the adoption ordinance. According to the adoption ordinance, um, relatives only includes 
if you are related to an infant as grandparents, brother, sister, uncle, or aunts, whether of the full full blood or the half blood or by infinity. Therefore, if you are, say, for example, a great grandparent, logically you have thoughts she or he will be one of the relatives, but unfortunately, according to the adoption ordinance, you are not a relative. And we are exactly facing this issue right now. We have a applicant who is the sister of the infant's grandparents. Um, she tried to apply for adoption, but just to find out that she is not a relative under the law, um, she will have to apply for leave and uh, go through extra steps. And it's quite important to bear this, bear this in mind, because if anyone breaches this section, it's considered as a criminal offence, and you are subject to imprisonment of six months. And if you study the rule carefully, it says that you are deemed to make arrangements or enter into one if you are making agreement or arrangement for adoption of infant by any other person. So it seems to suggest that if you are actually the person making the adoption application, it would not be treated as arranging for adoption. But in practice, there, there's no point in taking the risk so when in doubt, we always seek for leave from the court. Okay, talking about persons who are able um, to apply for um, an adoption order in Hong Kong, we see a lot of cases in recent years as to whether same-sex couples can adopt a children in Hong Kong. And in some cases, um, uh, these couples are married overseas. However, their marriage is not recognized under Hong Kong law because Hong Kong has not yet legalized same-sex marriage. So in these circumstances, um, it is still possible for the couple to adopt. However, um, there cannot be a joint application under the Hong Kong law as spouses because the marriage is not recognized under Hong Kong law. Um, in these cases, we would um, advise for um, there to be an application by a sole applicant. And um, the criteria which applies to a sole applicant um, in you know, other families in this case will also apply to that person who um, in fact is in a same sex uh, relationship, but then um, is applying um, solely because um, of the fact that Hong Kong law is unable to recognize the marriage. So, you know, the all the same criteria apply as to age and as to background. Um, so this might be um, an interesting area which people would like to look into in terms of uh, adopting. So um, looking into the procedure uh, for adoption, so Rafael, you talked a lot about um, getting consent. So um, I noticed that for adoption, generally speaking, in Hong Kong, um, every uh, adoption um, has to uh, commence by way of an application to court. And for um, adoption, which are not private adoptions and those who are basically um done through the social welfare department, um, we see that, you know, all children who are suitable for adoption are in fact placed into the adoptees pool. And um, the adoption agency and the social welfare department, they will work together to try to find the best compatible matches of parent and children. And well, of course, um, these um, applications by the social welfare department, they are still guided by the uh, principal um for the best interests of the children and um, not that it's done on a first come first serve basis as in you know a, if a parent applies first then he or she gets a higher chance of adopting a child so these procedures are in the context of um, uh, adoption which are done through the social welfare department uh, what happens when um, lawyers are actually involved let's say in a, in a, in a private adoption procedure uh, generally, when when a client came to us, of course we have to make sure that all the criteria that I mentioned are fulfilled. Um, and the second thing is whether he or she, the applicant, can obtain successfully obtain the consent from whoever consent needs to be obtained. Um, and once consent is secured, or we know that consent can be secured, then we can issue what we called a Form 1 
to the director of social welfare. The form one basically is a notice to the director that the applicant intends to adopt the infant. And within four months from lodging the form one, we have to take out the application. So we have a bit of time from lodging the form one and uh, preparing for the application. The client can also use the time to secure the consent because as I said, sometimes the consent has to be obtained overseas and it takes time for them to get it signed, notarized and mail the original back to us. Um, another point to Nox is that the adoption application always starts at the family court. Um, the rule says it has to start at the family court, the district court, and judgment also said we should always start at the district court. But it doesn't mean that it will always end up at the district court or the family court. Um, one of the cases where consent cannot be obtained and where you have to seek dispense with consent, then we can always apply to transfer the case to the high court. Now, this is a little bit technical point. Um, the law actually says if you cannot secure the consent, you shall transfer the case to the high court. It seems to suggest that you have no option. Uh, but we did a case where we basically obtained the dispense with consents at the um, at the family court. So we do not even have to deal with the transfer issue because the consent is already dispensed with. But of course, if the case is transferred to the high court, then it adds to the cost and the time and everything. Um, there's also a technical point that we need to pay attention to is once we take out the application, the director will become the guardian ad litem of the infant. There's no court fees payable for adoption cases, but there's a fee payable to the social welfare department as the guardian ad litem. And also, although the procedure is private and confidential, the social welfare department would prepare a very lengthy and detailed report uh, with a lot of information to be supplied by the clients, the applicants. And the report is also generally a private document. Now, I, I stopped at getting the consent. I, I digressed a little bit. So after getting the consent and prepare the form one, and you will prepare the, the actual application for adoption, what we call the form two and form three. So basically form one, two, three. So it's easy to remember. Um, and after you send that everything to the courts, get the consent done, pra practically from your date of birth, basically, like the, your siblings, your work history, your financial history, your medical history and everything, your criminal record, everything. The purpose, obviously, is to make sure that the applicant is a suitable applicant. Um, so after the they conduct the investigation, they prepare their report and they will inform us that the report is ready. And then we can go to court and fix a hearing date. And at the hearing date, if everything goes smoothly, we will get the adoption order right away, immediately on the date of the adoption. That pretty much is the overall picture of the general procedure. So um, upon granting the adoption order, um, the adoptive parents will have the same parental obligations and rights as any other birth parent. And uh, the adopted child will also enjoy the same rights as any biological child under the laws of Hong Kong. So this means that um, the child will basically be treated as a natural child of the family. And, um, you know, this is um, and there is no distinction between him and any um, child of the family who is of natural uh, birth. This is quite uh, significant um, in recent years, especially um, as we see a lot of cases where an, an adoption, a private adoption is done uh, for the purpose of relocation or getting um, overseas passports. Because um, let's say if um, uh, the birth parent of um, the child has remarried and the new spouse ha has um, an overseas passport, getting the new spouse to adopt the uh, natural born child of the uh, birth parent can, um, in fact, um, allow the child to get an overseas passport. And because of, um, you know, the trend 
recently um, a lot of families are relocating, and if um, families are uh, intend to get um, a passport for um, any child um, um, who is you know a stepchild or or, or, or the child of a relative, um, they may consider um, adoption so that um, the child will get um, a passport um, from um, the applicant of the adoption upon the adoption order. So today we talked a lot about um, the adoption um, in general, um, as in what is the criteria for an adoption, um, the difference between doing an adoption privately and doing it through the social welfare department, and what uh, procedures are there for an adoption, including getting the consent, um, filing a court application, and the effect of an adoption. So Rafael, um, I noticed that um, you have been in this firm for uh, quite a while now. And do you see any trend in respect of adoption cases in Hong Kong? Uh, yes, we do. We actually have uh, received growing numbers of inquiries and interest in uh, getting an adoption order. Now, you mentioned that uh, passport is obviously one of the one of the major reasons, uh, but obviously there are other also other reasons, such as uh, I've seen many families who have been caring for the infants for a number of years, and they do really want to formalize the relationship and uh, strengthen their bonding. And uh, I, do, I do agree that for these kind of cases, the adoption order would definitely be in the interest of the infants. Uh, they, they can finally call the carer his or her parents after taking care of them so, for so many years. And as I said, the, the the market trend is that there is a growing number of interests. And obviously, people are also thinking of alternative living arrangements. So the passport would be something that's uh, was quite helpful for them. Thank you, Rafael, for sharing your experiences on um, the procedures and the market trend on the adoption process. And um, it's been really nice talking to you today. Um, and hopefully um, our listeners could also get some insights from this adoption podcast. Thank you. Tune in and listen to more episodes of the Hip Talks podcasts by checking the insights section at our website at www.huglenip.com and our channels on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcast, and Stitcher. They're also available on Huglenip's YouTube channel. You can send comments and feedback to our email address, hello at huglenip.com. Please share the Hip Talks with your friends, family, and business associates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Its contents do not constitute legal or professional advice. <laughs>